Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Come style, Lina. Bene, grazie. <laughs> <laughs> e tu? Uh, very well, thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, well, you. grazie. Tudor, how are you doing? Hello, hello, everybody here, yes? Everybody yes, here? Absolutely. Hi. Everybody here, I hope. Yes, everybody's here. Good. Excellent. Testing mic microphones, lights, mm. connections. Very good. So everybody looks very good. Hello. Mm. It's Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm okay. So far, so good. I'm my video is off, so you're not gonna be able to see my uh yeah. Beautiful face. But uh, I'm gonna be in the background making sure everything's okay. Okay, okay I'm gonna mute myself. <clears throat> Everything is I think there are 43 participants already, is it? Joined? Yeah. Fantastic. Judah, you're happy with the background lighting? You have uh, giving... It's fantastic. It's very good. <laughs> well, we the, the, the director and the master of light. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> the master of camera and lightning? <laughs> yes, exactly. Or lighting? <laughs> Oh, he's a bronchoscopist after all. <laughs> uh, Lina, how is how is the weather in uh, Italy at the moment? It's very, very, very hot. Very, very hot. Oh dear. Uh, we have uh, a strange uh, uh, times because uh, on April and May uh, was uh, so cold, but uh, June was dramatic uh, and uh, a very high grade of uh, humidification. So the perception of, of uh, the hot is very, very high. But this is better for the coronavirus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not for us, but mm. for the coronavirus, uh, I hope. Yeah. So if it's, hot, if it's hot in Italy, I think in Cairo is, is probably uh, baking hot or... 35 degrees, Thomas. 35. How much? 35. And that's not too bad. <laughs> Is it not too bad? Okay. And it's very humid. Is it very humid? Is it? Uh, by I, the way, just do you, let's let's. Um, um, can you do you have um, do you have some headphones for um, for the presentation? Mm. I think I think the connection is a bit slow. Uh, who are you talking to? Yes. Go on. Ahmed? He's on the phone to somebody today. Yes. And... Uh, we, we think the connection is a bit slow. Uh, is that, are you close to the um, router or uh, um, is, is, is it is, it is as it is? Yes, I hear you very well. We see you with some interruptions, but maybe because he's going to Japan and then coming to London. I hear you and see you very well. Okay. Okay. Good. And Spaso A, how is it there in your place? It's very warm, is it? Yeah. In, it's, in Serbia, it's very warm and uh, it's going to rain now. I can hear thunders. So uh, 
we have uh, we are going to have like in maybe in half an hour it will be a storm here in in, in oh, Serbia. Gosh. Yeah, but okay. we're used to Do it. you think the elect electricity will remain on remain on? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't care about this because I'm on the mobile phone. Uh, I connected <laughs> everything, so uh, everything is on battery. So I don't have any. I, I don't expect any problems with electricity. <laughs> it will work. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm not worrying. Oh, thanks. Okay. What's the weather like in England? Uh, well, I'm in the uh, let, northwest uh, of England. Robert, <laughs> it's raining, huh? Uh, here it's not raining, raining at the moment. The today it, it didn't rain today, but uh, it's partly cloudy. Temperature is 15 degrees at the moment, 1.5. Mm -hmm. um, so quite uh, pleasant presently. Oh. Yeah. I'm in the north of England, uh, north of uh, northwest of England in Tudors in London. I'm in London, yes. It's, uh, it's sunny. I mean, I can see the, uh, the sky, no clouds which is good for, uh, for our brains, but it's a bit uh, windy and it's warm. It's not, it's not very cold. Mm. Good. So I think we'll start uh, in what, nine minutes? Yes, nine we'll minutes start. Uh, That's correct. Michael, nine Michael, minutes. everything okay with the uh, YouTube uh, connection? Yeah, um, we're streaming live now via YouTube. Okay. And we've got 50 Do you guys want to have the uh, Do you want to have the link on uh, WhatsApp? Um sure, I'll send it right now. Okay. okay. Um, Michael, so uh, when I have to uh, speak, I have to uh, push the green button, share screen, and then uh, click to my presentation. That's okay, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. And Michael, uh, just remind us how much time do we have uh, in total before the lights uh, switch off? Well, um, we should finish by um, in 90 minutes. So 30 minutes yeah. per speaker is the, the, the rough guideline. Okay. Uh, are you asking that you've got unlimited uh, thing in case we overrun? Is that correct? Oh, no, Michael? yeah. It's, yeah. We, we could we could go over the limit if we have yeah. to. Yeah. Ah, it's working on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. See, take note that there's a 30 second delay between the Zoom and mm -hmm. YouTube. So if you're going to solicit questions, there's going to be a delay. So expect that. Oh, interesting. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I think the, uh, the YouTube can be confusing if you want to have the feedback from YouTube. Uh, so uh, keep that as a. Um, as a check. Uh, on YouTube? As a spare option. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So take note. Yeah. So if you're going to solicit questions, there's going to be questions. Actually, our conversation is being heard on YouTube. Is there everybody able to hear it or just us? No, it's live. Uh, your audio is live. So keep that in mind. <laughs> so they can hear us now. Yes. Pay yes. attention. Pay attention what you are saying. Uh, a good banter, you know, it, it yeah. makes for a lively, uh, free. <laughs> yeah, they can't see us, but they can hear us. Lena, don't worry. Just yet, you are adjusting your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I have too much light. 
<laughs> I closed the okay, window but... last time. <laughs> Five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so as a, like zero, a... <laughs> as a zero mm -hmm. minute mark, um, I'm gonna um, cue, I'm gonna switch to uh, Spastia's um, video. Yes. And then from Dr. Popovich to Dr. Toma, and then speaker one. Okay. Okay, good. I was saying this is like uh, SpaceX uh, launch. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll launch anyway. The weather is good. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> we don't do any count uh, countdown. 10, eight. Do you think these webinars will go on forever or will we go back to uh, physical meetings? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of desire to go back to physical meetings, but I don't see how that will be possible in the next six months uh, or so. I mean, the BTS, yeah the British Thoracic Society meeting has been postponed now until February, I think. In Italy, we are considering to reopen in October, but uh, absolutely we have not the certain because uh, just uh, in the recent uh, week, uh, we have uh, an increase of number of cases. So I don't know, probably we can consider the uh, meeting with the physical uh, attendance uh, next year. What do you think? What's what's the feeling in, e in Egypt, uh, Ahmed? Uh, not very soon, Toma. So our meeting in next December, we are planning to uh, planning for it to be uh, digital. The big meeting in December is going to be digital. I suspect going forward, we'll have a number of hybrid meetings. Uh, maybe, you know, next year we'll have, we'll have to be realistic and plan hybrid meetings, that is physical plus uh, facility to do uh, webinars at the same time or telecast at the same time. Uh, that's what we are planning for the BTS anyway, for February. I mean, in a way, the uh, the I think the webinars are uh, reaching uh, far more uh, people than uh, than a physical meeting. Uh, and uh, so I was reading the Imperial College, for example, they're putting their their courses online for free. So, you know, you can instead of reaching 100 students, you can reach now 10,000 people who would be interested. So, yeah, Absolutely. that that is an advantage. Yeah, and uh, more green, uh, flexible, you know, attendance. You know, you can attend part of the yeah. meeting, carry on with your work. You don't need to worry about all the airports and delays and booking in advance. Yeah. You can dress up to here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, one of the advantages. <laughs> Is that... Is that what you've done today, Tudor, then? Well, no, oh, I, uh, I'm, I'm fully dressed, just, yeah, just to reassure you. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. We don't want any proof at the moment. <laughs> you don't want, okay, good.
I think we are ready to go. Yes. Okay. Can you switch? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar Bronchoscopy and COVID Pre Present and Future, organized by World Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. My name is Dr. Spasoje Popovic. I'm Chief of Interventional Pulmonology Unit in Clinic for Pulmonology in Clinical Center of Serbia in Belgrade, Serbia. World Association of Bronchology has helped uh, to sponsor and conduct numerous educational activities, seminars and hands-on sessions around the world. And through the widely recognized Bronchoscopy Education Project and other new teaching tools, World Association of Bronchology is actively promoting a uniform, multi-dimensional, structured way of learning uh, to help assure that fundamentals of bronchoscopy and, uh, are learned and mastered uh, uh, regardless uh, on, of one's place of uh, practice or medical environment. All World Association of Bronchology programs are competency oriented and based on proven principles of education and mastery learning. In the current time, times, unfortunately, those methods are being adopted to allow distance learning as on-site seminars will not be possible for a long while, I think. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tudor Toma, consultant respiratory physician from University Hospital Lewis and Greenwich uh, from United Kingdom, who is a co-moderator of this webinar. Thank you, Spasore. It's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to co-chair this uh, webinar with you and with all our guests uh, from uh, different countries uh, in the world. To continue your introduction, I'll say that um, after years of very successful educational programs on basic and advanced uh, bronchoscopy that placed the uh, WABIP as a leading player in worldwide um, education, the organization is now responding to the need of knowledge for bronchoscopy in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic. And, um, and the aftermath after the pandemic. So world uh, leaders have acquired now experience and got uh, evidence about different topics uh, related to bronchoscopy and uh, they are ready to provide their evidence-based uh, uh, recommendations for the current and for the future practice um, of um, bronchoscopy. Our priority priority here is to help train physicians all over the world, uh, and that is why we do these uh, webinars. In general, we want to promote the safe, uh, the safe implementation of uh, conventional and also of uh, new technologies uh, with, the, um, with the highest standards of uh, safety and uh, quality. The um, strategy for this webinar was to invest a lot of effort in sharing more uh, experience, more personal experience than just uh, opinions. So the things which you are going to hear uh, are based on uh, personal experience of every single uh, lecturer. Um, and now I would like to introduce to you our excellent uh, speakers and panelists. So from uh, uh, Ancona, from Italy, we have Dr. Lina Zucatosta, who is the chief uh, pulmonology unit in Ancona in Italy. We have Dr. Ahmed Al-Fahawi, uh, who is in Cairo, Egypt, and he's professor of medicine uh, at Cairo University. He's one of the leading uh, Egyptians, interventional pulmonologists. He's a board member of the um, Egyptian Scientific Society of uh, uh, Bronchology. 
And from here, from UK, we have Dr. Mohamed Munawar, who is the current president of the British Thoracic Society and also the president of the um, European Association of uh, uh, Bronchoscopy and uh, Interventional uh, Pulmonology. So with all this um, introductions, give the microphone back to you for the remaining of the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Tudor, thank you. Your uh, good side of these webinars is actually availability to the higher number of people com um, comparing to classic learning, uh, among other advantages. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Lina Zucatosta, uh, Chief of Pulmonology Unit in uh, Ancona in Italy. She's going to speak about bronchoscopy in diagnosis and management of complications of COVID infection. Lina Prego. Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you, uh, Spazoye, thank you, Teodora and the organizer for inviting me. It's a really a great pleasure for me uh, to share this webinar uh, with you. Uh, this is, uh, this slide represent what is uh, uh, COVID-19 in Italy, uh, important data and incredible um, different distribution of incidence because most of the cases, most of the data were in Lombardia near Milan, the richest region in Italy, uh, the region with the best local welfare organization. My topic regarding management of a complication in COVID patient treated with mechanical ventilation and the role of bronchoscopy in late complication of COVID-19. I will show you all cases from my experience. Um, this is a, a young lady. Uh, she was admitted in uh, uh, emergency department for uh, severe respiratory failure. She was intubated and during the intubation, she developed uh, uh, hypertensive uh, um, new thorax and chest drainage was uh, uh, um, put and the patient had the re-expansion of the lung. She was extubated, she was admitted in our uh, COVID unit. Uh, the oxygen saturation in air was that, but she uh, developed mild dyspnea and TC scan showed and loculated the new thorax. So uh, we put a pigtail drainage, this is Professor Gasparini uh, performing the procedure, the patient immediately had a relief of uh, uh, um, uh, dyspnea uh, and uh, uh, she felt better, but we aspirate more hair uh, than we expected on the basis on TC scan. So we perform another TC scan because uh, we suspected a bronchopleural fistula because we had hair leaking through the uh, drainage. And in effect, on the basis on the TC scan, we put an endobronchial valve in a subsegmental bronchus of B10 immediately we obtain the uh, stop of high leakage. And this is uh, the chest X-ray a couple uh, a week ago with uh, a complete resolution of the neothorax. So we removed the, the uh, pigtail drainage and the valve. And this is a TTC scan one month later, the discharge of the patient. The patient is at home now and is uh, in good condition. But look, there is no more neothorax, but these are typical 
late complication and we speak about this. Another problem in ventilated patient is the superinfection due to bacteria and fulgal. This man was admitted in ICU, intubated, not tracheostomized, uh, but despite of the COVID treatment and broad spectrum antibiotic therapy, had the persistent fever and developed an abscess. Uh, we performed bronchoscopy with the bronchoalveolar lavage and we obtained Klebsiella pneumonia multi resistant. So we treat the patient with imipenem and calistine, and we put also a thin drainage inside the uh, cavity. And this is uh, the evolution. The patient feel better, the patient was discharged to the hospital with uh, uh, evolution in granulation nodules. And we, we saw a lot of cases like this. Another dramatic complication in patient ventilated for a long time is the superinfection to do it to fungal, uh, because this patient has a very critical uh, uh, leukopenic with a low count of lymphocyte. And this woman unfortunately died 78 days after mechanical ventilation. And look the evolution of the pneumonia with multiple uh, cavity and bronchoscopic findings, bronchoveolar lavage show was positive for galatman Aspergillus fumigatus and Escherichia coli. We see uh, almost uh, three cases of a super infection due to Aspergillus. Another problem is the complication due to intubation and uh, tracheostomy. Uh, to be honest, uh, we didn't observe serious complication due to tracheostomy. I want to show you just only this case. A uh, patient was intubated for 11 days and then tracheostomized. And this is uh, the uh, lumen of the trachea, the tracheostomy, the cannula. And in a subglottic space in the third superior of the trachea, we have a substenosis due to a ring of uh, cartilage. And this is a, a typical complication of prolonged orotracheal intubation. Um, probably uh, the patient with the COVID-19 are intubated longer compared to non-COVID patient because the tracheostomy is considered for high risk of accidental decannulation during uh, the proning. And in how I see you, the pronation was using uh, in all of the patient. Another com complication is uh, hemorrhage in patient uh, treated with ICMO. Uh, the, most, uh, uh, the most dramatic patient, the patient with the, the serious, the severe respiratory failure, were treated with ICMO, 11 patients in our hospital. And this patient during ICMO uh, developed immediately and suddenly hemorrhage through the uh, tracheostomy tube with the severe desaturation. We immediately perform bronchoscopy through the tracheostomy tube. This is uh, the tracheostomy tube, and this is the lumen of the trachea, completely occluded by coagules. So we immediately intubate the patient with a rigid scope, and we remove the cannula and with rigid forceps, uh, a rigid aspirator and uh, um, uh, cryo, we uh, remove uh, we remove the coagules and we observe also uh, that the bleeding was coming to the peripheral of the lung. This patient, this patient died. Uh, one week uh, uh, later, and we perform a three rigid bronchoscopy to uh, avoid the, the exitus. What could be the role 
of bronchoscopy uh, for the late complication of uh, uh, coronavirus. This is a very interesting uh, you know, Italian report, uh, and uh, this is the largest cohort of post-mortem analysis uh, of patients who died from COVID-19, uh, and uh, the autopsy was done uh, in two hospital, uh, Sacco on Milan and Papa Giovanni XXIII on uh, Bergamo. Bergamo is uh, the city with the greatest number of died. And interesting, all the cases showed features of uh, uh, diffuse alveolar damage. All cases had capillary congestion, necrosis of a pneumocyte, yellow membrane, uh, interstitial and intralveolar edema, uh, type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, and plated fibrin thrombi. And we know very well from the SARS uh, what are the phases uh, of diffuse alveolar damage, an acute phase uh, with uh, intralveolar and interstitial edema, an organizing phase, uh, intermediates, uh, and a late phase, a fibrotic phase with collagenous fibrosis uh, and architectural remodeling. And this is uh, perfectly in accord to the TC scan that we are observing in the follow-up of our patient. Look, these are some example, March, and June, March, uh, at the time of the admission, severe respiratory failure, mechanical ventilation, then non-invasive ventilation treatment. The patient uh, was discharged, uh, is uh, at his home quite well, but look the evolving of the lung with fibrosis. And this is a female, same situation, admission in March, severe respiratory failure, mechanical ventilation, and then the evolution. The patient now is a tumor, is quite good, but look at the evolution with the fibrosis of the lung. Now we are conducting a follow-up of our patient. I had 112 COVID patients. And uh, our follow-up is a clinical follow-up, uh, radiological follow-up with this scan uh, with the pulmonary functional test. All patients are in good clinical status uh, with male fatigue due to the loss of uh, uh, kilograms, the loss of uh, uh, muscles during uh, the hospitalization, normal value of uh, blood analysis, normal uh, spirometry, normal value of hemogas analysis, but very interesting, all patients show male to moderate reduction of uh, uh, diffusion uh, capacity. And so uh, a possible rule of bronchoscopy is a transbronchial cryobiopsy uh, cryo as uh, for the study of interstitial lung disease and non-COVID uh, because uh, uh, we need more data uh, in order to know the histological patterns the, uh, of the uh, fibrotic finding in this scan. We know that probably the fibrosis uh, of COVID-19 is a non-progressive fibrosis, but, but we have to understand better the mechanism uh, in perspective of the use of novel uh, anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic uh, drugs. This is my last picture. The picture show the cities uh, of Italy during uh, the lockdown. We have three months of lockdown and uh, it was uh, really a tragedy for uh, the Italian people uh, and I hope uh, uh, for Italy and for all countries on the world that we never have to live again a similar period. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Lina, uh, for your excellent presentation, uh, which uh, undoubtedly come from great experience you have by doing interventions in COVID patients. Uh, we are now open for questions, for comments, for uh, discussion. And uh, just uh, before discussion starts, I, I, I would like to ask one question. Uh, we all know prolonged intubation is often the case with these patients. And uh, do you perform bronchoscopy immediately, immediately after extubation, uh, after removal of the tracheal tube to assess uh, the tracheal mucosa uh, to see if there are any pseudomembranes uh, or anything which can later develop into a, a full tracheal uh, or post-tracheostomy stenosis? That will be my question. Thank you. Uh, not routinely. We perform bronchoscopy if the patient develops symptoms, uh, teresia, and uh, we uh, absolutely perform bronchoscopy in patient uh, with a tracheostomy before to remove the cannula in order to assess the subglottic space and stenosis. In patient just only intubated or tracheal intubation, we perform bronchoscopy at the symptoms, just only at the symptoms. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I think we agree to take a couple of questions now and we'll have some more questions at the discussion. Um, and uh, we can uh, go to the, um, uh, the question and answers panel, for example, Lina. So somebody is asking if you have any experience with antifibrotic drugs to slow down progression of the pulmonary fibrosis. Very good question. Not now. Now we are um, working in a national multicentric study uh, with cryobiopsy in order to assess the grade of fibrosis uh, and probably uh, prospective to treatment. Um, we don't have experience with uh, antifibrotic uh, treatment in COVID-19 in COVID patient now. Uh, interesting, we don't have in Italy cases uh, of uh, patient with idiopathic fibrosis uh, affected by COVID-19. We were very afraid because these are very critical patients. Just one report cases. And so uh, the, uh, probably there is a connection. We will study uh, this aspect uh, because you know that there is a, a lot of uh, uh, discordance regarding the use of steroid treatment during the acute phase. All the patients that we are observing are patient ventilated, are patient with the most severe disease, uh, treated most of them with tocilizumab and steroid. Uh, we maintain steroid treatment, low dose, uh, after the discharge. And uh, probably this is the first check. Then we will schedule it a second check with the TC scan and the pulmonary functional test. And probably if we will assess that there is fibrosis, we can consider the treatment of, with antifibrotic disease or novel, novel agent. There are novel agent proposed and the mechanism of the fibrosis in a COVID patient is quite different from the HPF uh, patient. You uh, another question. Thank you very uh, much. Um, thank you too. Yes, another question. Uh, which which segments of the lung uh, do you do cryobiopsy uh, from uh, in COVID patients, and do you do it in areas with CT findings uh, or random? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, this 
QD is coming to go, um, we uh, select the most representative area. Uh, it's a very easy uh, and safer to perform a cryobiopsy through the basal segment because you can easily insert the balloon and you have the complete control of bleeding. Uh, but if you have a involved area in the middle lobe or in the upper lobe, you have to uh, perform uh, uh, biopsies in the involved, uh, in involved area. So is the T C scan and the uh, most involved segment that guide the cryobiopsy. Thank you. Okay, can we take another question? So uh, Hugo Oliveira from Brazil, I think he's asking about the, um, the pressures uh, for the intubated patient. So when you do a bronchoscopy in the intubated patient, how important it is to keep the positive pressure, lose negative pressure? What, uh, what is your experience with, with doing the bronchoscopy in these patients? Uh, uh, it's uh, very hard to answer for me because uh, I work with the anesthesiologist. So for the uh, pressure, for the support, uh, I is the anesthesiologist that uh, uh, organize. Uh, Sometimes in my experience, uh, um, and for COVID patient, also for non-COVID patient, uh, performing bronchoscopy in, uh, through a orotracheal tube, uh, not so large, uh, 7.5 to 8 point, uh, is uh, difficult because the patient is sedated sometimes with the uh, cura room. Uh, and when you introduce the Bronchoscope, you limit the hole and uh, the flow, and a patient can desaturate. So, in case the very, if you have to perform just uh, a, a bronchial alveolar lavage, a very fast procedure, it's okay. But if you have to perform a longer procedure, remove of coagules or others. Uh, um, sometimes uh, it's preferred to, to introduce the patient with a rigid. Regarding the pressure, uh, probably, I, I don't know because uh, it's uh, absolutely, I never interest, I completely depend on the anesthesiologist. Most of uh, the patient were very um, superficial uh, with the very low, ventilated with the, uh, very low pressure because uh, the lung of uh, uh, coronavirus patient is a very easy to ventilate. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Was... Thank you. Thank you. And very, one last question before we move to the next lecture. What was your protocol to clean uh, bronchoscope uh, after the intervention and before the next intervention? Uh, okay. Is it different from uh, usual protocol or not? Okay, okay. Uh, for uh, uh, the most of the bronchoscopy, we use a single use bronchoscope, uh, um, disposable bronchoscope. So we perform the procedure and then uh, um, is a single use uh, um, bronchoscope. So we have not to clean uh, um, the instrument. For all the other procedure, and you consider that uh, we perform it during this period, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage or other procedure in cavity patient, but also we continue with the uh, normal bronchoscopy activity. Uh, we use the same protocols for non-COVID patient because uh, um, uh, the coronavirus is a very easy uh, to, to kill uh, at very low temperature. So we have the protocol with sterilization, with uh, a cleaning, uh, wash uh, the instrument before the sterilization. It's absolutely the same protocol, but we 
work in an area, uh, our service in an area with negative pressure. And we have uh, a way for the dirty instrument and a way for the clean -up instrument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture and for answering all our questions. So we are ready to go to the next lecture. Uh, although healthcare systems in the whole world are now focused uh, on fighting with uh, COVID uh, infection, uh, no one can neglect the fact that uh, people get sick and die from other diseases, such as lung cancer, where bronchoscopy plays the key role in diagnosis and timely treatment. Both we and our patients have to deal with that burden. So how to organize and how to perform routine bronchoscopy for non-COVID indi indications in these difficult times? We expect the answer from our distinguished uh, lecturer, Dr. Ahmed al Halfavi from uh, Egypt. Ahmed, please give us your lecture. Thank you very much, Tatsoi. Um, I would like first to thank the uh, organizing of the uh, webinar and uh, thank the World Association of Oncology for giving me the chance to participate in this webinar. Um, And uh, as you said, um, that we have to move in. There are other patients uh, that need bronchoscopies uh, other than COVID patients. And uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to go through some of the, of the points that will help us uh, keep the bronchoscopy uh, service moving. So bronchoscopy, as you know, is a major coordinating procedure, and we have to make every effort to uh, reduce the risk of infection to healthcare workers. Um, the do no harm concept of patients, for patients, the rights now, we have to have the do no harm for healthcare workers also. And especially the interventional bronchoscopy is one aspect of bronchoscopy that mainly deals with procedures that cannot be delayed for a long time. Um, as we all know, there have been some societal guidelines and sta statements concerning the performance of bronchoscopy for non-COVID patients in the COVID area. And you can uh, uh, find a nice summary of these, uh, uh, of these uh, statements in respirology and the, the articles here. Um, there is an agreement to delay non-urgent procedures, but there is no agreement as the, the timing of the end of this pandemic. So uh, 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 a patient that has come with bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy is suggestive of sarcoidosis in March, and we uh, postponed the procedures for uh, one month, and then in April we said we will postpone again for another month, the next month she says, no, I uh, need a procedure, I need the procedure. So we have to find an agreement as how to perform these procedures. But what first, what is an emergency or a non-emergency bronchoscopy? Um, an emergency bronchoscopy is the, uh, a, broncos a, a procedure to save the life of the patient. Um, while an, an urgent bronchoscopy is a bronchoscopy that needs to be done as soon as possible uh, and cannot be delayed for a long time. Non-urgent bronchoscopies are, are procedures that can be delayed for one, two, or three months. Like, for instance, non-urgent bronchoscopies in patients with sar suspected sarcoidosis, patients who have mild tracheal or bronchial stenosis, special lung disease, or patients who are coming for non-urgent procedures like um, lung volume, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction or bronchial phenoplasty. While emergency procedures, like in uh, cases of life-threatening hemopsis, like significant airway uh, obstruction by a neoplasm or blood clot that needs to be recanalized or, or removed the, the clot or mucus. Patients with severe tracheal stenosis um, uh, who need dilatation patients with foreign body aspiration, uh, uh, occluding a major bronchus, 
and patients for, uh, and, in, and uh, for evaluation of the road traffic accidents, burns, or in cases of migrated stems. These are procedures that need to be dealt with immediately. They cannot wait. And there are some ur urgent bronchoscopies that can be delayed for one or two days, um, like patients who are suspected to have malignancy central, by a central mass or a lymph node component, patients who need EBUS for staging, um, foreign bodies that are not occluding a major bronchus or mild to moderate muscle. So there are indications for urgent bronchoscopies and bronchoscopies that can be delayed. In a pandemic, there is no emergency. Um, healthcare workers are force multipliers, and you need to look to have to put your needs first. So if you don't have the required equipment to protect the healthcare workers, you don't have to do the bronchoscopy. You have to refer for a center that has the the, uh, the capacity to do so. We need at least uh, N95 masks uh, or the uh, powered uh, uh, air purifiers. Uh, over the N95, we, we put on surgical masks so we can discard the surgical mask and keep the N95 for the for the whole day. We use a coverall suit. And you can cover it with a disposable gown that you can get rid of after the after each procedure. The disposable overhead, double gloves, face shield with goggles, and overshoot. So no bronchoscopy in the in the COVID era should be done without these precautions. And uh, before the before uh, uh, having patients for the procedures, we need to evaluate if these patients are COVID positive or negative. The most commonly used method is the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, PCR. Although it's not readily available in every institution, some institutions have to uh, outsource the, 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 the test uh, and it might take some time before it, the results are available, up uh, to 72 hours, now it's, it's faster, but it's only reliable in 60 to 70%. And the problem of positive PCR after the patients have improved is causing a lot of problem and, and, uh, 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 and, um, and we are not sure if the patient has recovered or not, we can do procedures. Also, the rapid tests uh, are not very uh, uh, reliable. Um, and in a state of wide community spread, every institution has developed its own protocol for triage. So for instance, in my hospital, we are not a COVID center, but uh, we have patients that come in for uh, emergency procedures and we have to um, evaluate these patients. So we have a, a, a group of uh, consultants and specialists every day to review the cases in the ER and, um, and uh, decide whether they should be referred to a COVID center or uh, that we should put them in isolation and test them for uh, for COVID or that they are safe to go and perform procedures. Um, and the problem of, the, of testing a case requiring emergency intervention is a big problem. And symptomatic cases are easier to identify, but the problem of asymptomatic carriers is the main problem. Routine testing of these patients is not uh, very easily done uh, for the sake of time expensive reliability and so we uh, tend to consider every patient as a potential carrier until proved otherwise. Um, all patients coming for bronchoscopy we should wear a, a surgical mask in the waiting area in the procedure room and in the recovery area. We put on a slotted mask, surgical mask during the procedure uh, with the suction catheter fixed at the mouth. Um, we use the transnasal approach um, uh, rather than the transoral. And um, ideally, these procedures should be done in a negative pressure room. If not available, then naturally ventilated room is preferable with sealed doors and uh, uh, to, to, um, to isolate it from the rest of the hospital. Um, we now perform all, all the procedures under general anesthesia or deep sedation to block the airway reflexes and uh, minimize the cough. Um, if 
single bronchoscopes are available, they'll be very helpful. Otherwise, through validated and serial, um, uh, validated and timely serialization of the scope separate from other instruments. Um, the, uh, for intervention procedures, the single use bronchoscopes are not very uh, helpful. And so we tend to use the, the, the regular scopes uh, more often. Um, we use the laryngeal mask, or sometimes we have to intubate the patients um, um, for the procedures. And also to make the procedure very swift. Now, the most senior bronchoscopists do the procedures nowadays. So um, this is to make it shorter. And also we don't allow trainees or house officers in the room. We try to minimize the number of attendees in the room. So the anesthesiologist, the bronchoscopist, and the, uh, uh, the assistant, and uh, uh, maximum of one, uh, one nurse to help uh, during the procedure. Um, most of our patients coming for, uh, for uh, uh, bronchoscopy other than COVID are the patients suspected of malignancy. And these patients cannot be uh, delayed for a long time. They have to be dealt with in a timely manner. And uh, especially if the resources in your center is not adequate to ensure safety of COVID negative suspected malignant patients, then refer these patients to COVID free center. Um, before performing procedures on these patients, you have to ensure that you have enough beds in the ICU. You don't want to perform procedure on a patient and have to put in ICU and all your ICU beds are are, um, um, are occupied whether by COVID patients or other patients. But in, the, in this area, in this era of COVID uh, patients, the ICU beds are very scarce. The routine bronchoscopies that we have to perform in the ICU, they cannot be stopped for diagnosing infection, for treatment of atelectasis, for guidance of percutaneous tracheotomies in patients who are not COVID patients. And in these situations, then all the staff should be wearing full PPE. Um, um, we put the patients on 100% oxygen with the modified PPEs and use minimal amounts of, of saline for bronchoalveolar lavage to minimize the aerosol that's generating by the positive pressure uh, ventilation. If the patients are not intubated, then it, it would be easier and better to move these patients to negative pressure rooms uh, 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 away from the from from other patients in the eyes. Uh, also, rigid bronchoscopy is uh, uh, widely used in the area of interventional pulmonology. But in COVID era, people tend to use less rigid bronchoscopy for interventional techniques. And if you and if it's unavoidable that you have to use a rigid scope, don't. So don't use the, the jet ventilation. Switch these uh, the, to a closed circuit ventilation connected to a viral filter. And uh, the flu valve uh, piece is very helpful to uh, minimize the, the aerosol generating during the, the rigid bronchoscopy. But most of the, of the centers now tend to use the or at least in our center, we tend to use the uh, flexible scope rather than the rigid scopes. Um, so an area of debate is when to do a bronchoscopy after a patient has recovered from COVID. Um, very, very uh, complex and, and, and different opinions. So the timing for not urgent bronchoscopy in a recovered patient um, needs to be individualized on each in, on a case by case uh, uh, scenario. D depending on the disease severity, um, uh, the duration of the of the disease itself, whether we can uh, do two um, negative PCR tests from at least two consecutive swabs more than 24 hours apart is not very. Uh, practical and sometimes you get one negative uh, test, the other one is positive. So th these um, uh, situations have to be individualized. Um, 
the um, the ACCP they uh, suggested that it would be reasonable to wait for at least 30 days after resolution of symptoms, but further research is needed to validate this suggestion about this waiting area. Um, please review the CDC guidelines for discontinuation of transmission-based precautions and disposition of patients with COVID-19 in healthcare settings, which help um, uh, give us uh, an idea about how, how uh, when the patients are not uh, uh, infectious after they have recovered from uh, COVID-19. And, and to conclude my, uh, my talk, so bronchoscopy for routine indications in the time of COVID um, uh, for non-COVID uh, uh, conditions should be triaged as emergency, urgent, or unurgent, or, or, uh, or bronchoscopy that can be delayed. Diagnostic bronchoscopy for non-urgent indications should be postponed, and we have to figure out till when and when we will be back, going back to our routine work. Urgent bronchoscopies cannot be uh, cannot be delayed, and they have to be um, uh, performed in timely manner, provided all precautions are taken to ensure the safety safety of the healthcare worker. Uh, and as we said, that uh, intervention bronchoscopy service is one of the least uh, affected services in this pandemic because all our patients, almost all our patients, are patients needing and uh, requiring urgent intervention. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for, for your presentation. Um, I want to encourage uh, all participants to send us uh, questions on uh, the Zoom platform or also on YouTube. Uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions on the YouTube as well. And uh, Michael from uh, Japan will put the questions on Zoom and we'll be able to, to see them. Uh, I also want to say hello to Professor Mehta who is uh, in the room. So no pressure guys with the, uh, with the presentations and with the, uh, with the answer. Um, and um, while we collect all these uh, uh, questions, uh, Ahmed, let me ask. Uh, so there is a question from, uh, uh, from Maria Shimon from Romania. Uh, if you can do bronchoscopy in jet ventilation um, in particular in patients with, with the COVID. So this relates more to the COVID uh, patients. What, what do you think? Well, jet ventilation is fine, but uh, now that the, 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 with the jet ventilation, the circuit is open and a, a, a lot of aerosol can be coming out from the, from the there is no expiratory limb to the to the um, that would take out the uh, expired air with the with the aerosol. So um, uh, uh, personally, we have all we have been doing uh, rigid bronchoscopy using the the closed circuit all the time. I don't have a rigid. Uh, I don't have a jet ventilation, so um, the uh, I can't answer with the uh, about the jet ventilation, but. We have been doing the, the rigid bronchoscopy as we have done it before with the closed circuit ventilation connected to a, um, connected to a um, anesthesia machine. Thank you very much. Spasso, do you, do you want to ask, yeah. a, um, carry on with questions? Yes, of course. Thank you, Tudor. Uh, what is your opinion about rapid sequence bronchoscopic intubation and uh, at uh, non-operating room? Uh, that's a question from Dr. Elhidzi. What do you think, Ahmed? I didn't get the question, Spatsoy. Uh, the, uh, what is your opinion about rapid sequence bronchoscopic intubation at uh, non-operating uh, room? Uh, probably uh, it's about uh, difficult airway management, difficult intubation. We all we often face these uh, pro, uh, things in every day's uh, uh, routine. Yeah, we, we, 
that can be in in the, in the ICU. Yes, you need to do. Uh, sometimes you need to do uh, intubation with the rigid with the flexible scope. Um, they have to be done. Uh, it's a lot of uh, aerosol coming out, but um, uh, nonetheless, you have to do it in the ICU. Okay, and uh, how to suppress cough referee reflex is it's another question. How do you suppress cough reflex uh, during uh, bronchoscopy in analgo sedation or when you are not using general anesthesia? Flexible. Deep sedation. Propofol is very good at blocking the airway reflexes, but uh, nowadays we, we always have an anesthesiologist in the room. So we, we, we don't do the, 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 uh, the midazolam uh, sedation. We do uh, more heavier sedation or uh, we put a laryngeal mask and have the patient uh, um, uh, under general anesthesia. Uh, thank you. And another question from Dr. Hideo Saka. Are there any bronchoscopists infected during bronchoscopic examination or treatment? Was there any infection uh, among uh, us, among bronchoscopists? Um, um, I'm glad that none of our team has been infected during the procedure. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, Tudor, any more questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, I would uh, be interested because uh, we uh, we have a bit of a problem here. What uh, so any specific? Um, um, Restrictions for eBus. Uh, so, how do you perform eBus? Uh, there is a question here as well about the eBus uh, in the COVID uh, era. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, very tricky. But we we uh, we all we want at, at the beginning we we uh, uh, delayed these procedures, but now we have to do them. Um, um, very wide uh, laryngeal mask, and we do the, the EBUS under general anesthesia. Okay, thank you very much. So, Spasso, sh shall we move to the next uh, presentation and we'll take some more questions uh, at the uh, discussion? Uh, would, would that be okay? Yes, perfectly. Yes, we can move to the next presentation. And uh, it's a very hard at the moment to predict uh, how the future will, will look like. Uh, facts and our knowledge are changing uh, fast as our daily practice. One thing is for sure, nothing will be the same anymore. We have to adopt new rules and reinforce the old ones. And uh, lessons from the present and the uh, glimpse uh, to the future will be the subject of our Last lecturer, uh, I am proud to present uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Munawar, and I'm asking him to proceed with his lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Spasue. Can you hear me clearly? Absolutely. Wonderful. I'm most grateful. It's an absolute delight and, a, and an honor to be here amongst this uh, audience and the faculty. Uh, enormously grateful to Tudor, yourself, the Wabib, and uh, Michael for inviting me to speak here, and also to Sylvia for choosing this uh, exotic title for my presentation today. Uh, Gone with the Wind, some of you may be rather young and may not have seen this movie, uh, an epic uh, from, the nine, from 1939. Uh, this lady, Scarlett O'Hara, in the movie, incidentally, Vivian Lee, uh, in case you don't know, was born in Darjeeling in India and then brought up in London. And uh, at the age of 53, unfortunately, she developed TB and she died of the condition. That was in 1967, incidentally, about the same time or just after the birth of the flexible bronchoscope, thanks to Shigito Ikeda. I have no conflict of interest. I've had the enormous pleasure and opportunity to work with a number of companies with regard to various pieces of equipment, but there is no conflict of interest with regard in relation to today's presentation. I'm going to cover this topic under the following headings. A uh, very brief introduction, a little bit of history, infections, COVID or otherwise, some potential changes to the bronchoscopy unit, and uh, 
a potential future pathway, something that we have been trying to implement in our institution and then conclude the presentation all within 15 minutes. So stay with me, it's gonna be rather quick. So COVID uh, has been marching um, relentlessly through the world, leaving a trail of devastation, distress, and number of deaths all over the world, unfortunately, and very sadly. And you can see the data, all of you will be seeing this on a daily basis. All these are figures, they are numbers, they are statistics, but every time we get an opportunity, we should pause for a moment and reflect on the fact that these are real people and we must spare a thought for them and their families and all the staff who looked after these people. It has been incredibly traumatic for many of us during this period. COVID does not spare royalty, does not spare any position, and it's not one of those diseases which affect a particular stray section of the population. There are some diseases where you could say the depri deprivation and social could be the cause, but here it affects everybody. Uh, admittedly, some people are affected more than others. We should also not forget the fact that there are other diseases killing people around the world at the same time, and I'm glad that Wabe picked that up in the program as well. Very high incidence of death-related TB and a variety of other infections. A word about a slide on the history. Way back in 1897, Gustav Killian demonstrated the use of rigid bronchoscopy. He was a rhinolaryngologist. And then Shigito Ikeda, a thoracic surgeon who himself suffered from tuberculous pleurisy as a medical student, went on to devise the flexible bronchoscope and said there is no hope, uh, there's more hope with the bronchoscope. Not much PPE being used here, as you can see, unlike now, uh, although as a thoracic surgeon, Shigito Ikeda was using PPE. We also talk about incremental pulmonology, and there are a number of uh, renowned uh, pioneers in that field. One in particular, Dumont, is uh, demonstrating how to dress up for a procedure. Well, he was uh, the pioneer in the 70s and 80s and 90s, teaching and training and devising various techniques, the Dumont stent, laser, rigid bronchoscopy, etc. Coming to infections, I'm glad that Atul uh, Mehta, Professor Mehta uh, from Cleveland Clinic is here because I borrowed the slide from him, I'm very grateful to him. Um, infections have been around for a long time. It's not just about COVID. The superbugs, as Atul wrote in this uh, article in chess, have been around, particularly pseudomonas, um, in, the, in the bronchoscopes. They have been transmitted from patient to patient uh, over the years, and there have been a number of outbreaks. This is something we need to take stock of. Although, more recently, the problem is infection of healthcare workers. You asked the question quite rightly, or somebody asked the question about whether bronchoscopists were infected. This is uh, data from Holland. I'm sorry, this is a busy slide, but just to give you the headlines from this slide, healthcare workers, 6% got infected in Holland in these two Dutch hospitals. Lorenzo uh, passed on this data to me when Lombardi, a study of seven hospitals showed the infection rate was between six and 15%. In Romania, Maria Simon, thank you, Maria, has passed on this data, personal communication showing that 4.2% health workers. Semra from Turkey very kindly informed me about this data with 6.5%. Now, you cannot tease out whether these are bronchoscopists or not. Many of them would be in pulmonologists. In the UK, for instance, more than 200 healthcare workers died related to COVID, and a significant percentage of those were doctors. If pulmonologists were infected, I am aware, we did a little survey for the BTS, for the British Thoracic Society, we know that there were a large number of pulmonary pulmonologists who were also infected. Whether they were infected during bronchoscopy or not is a different question, a difficult question to answer, because there many of these pulmonologists would have looked after patients in the COVID ward, like uh, Tudor and myself do on a day-to-day -day basis. So where it was picked up, in fact, if you look at the data in the UK, there were hardly any intensive care, and there was no intensive care physicians, and there were no pulmonologists amongst that uh, people, number of people who died, possibly because there's the better uh, uh, protections and precautions taken in that arena. So it's come to the situation when we talk about complications of bronchoscopy, when we teach, and Atul used to say this as well, there are complications which we talk about which are excessive bleeding, hypoxia, 
over sedation, pneumothorax, and for us bronchoscopists over the years, one of the most dreaded complications has been a non-diagnostic bronchoscopy, certainly in the pre-EBUS era. We have to add one other complication now, besides the damage to the scope, and that complication is staph infection. This is to be borne in mind while planning services going forward. Atul has written a beautiful article, a seminal article in CHESS two years ago about the importance, because how do you deal with this staph infection and complications related to bronchoscopy? Maybe we have been blasé about choosing patients for bronchoscopy and therefore being doing too many bronchoscopies where it is not absolutely necessary. We have to think again now, reflect, and think again about indications. Choose patients carefully. Isolated pleural effusion. Incidental mediastinal adenopathy in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Do we really need to do a bronchoscopy in EBUS? Is there much to be gained in classical sarcoidosis stage one with Lovgren's? Do we really need to do bronchoscopy? We have to think again. That's what uh, this paper uh, highlights. And as uh, Atul repeatedly says in his talks, because it should, could be done, that doesn't mean it should be done. And a good bronchoscopist is one who knows when not to perform a bronchoscopy. And again, in pulmonary nodules, if you take now, bronchoscopy per se has a low diagnostic yield. Yes, if you have the ability to add on radial probe EBUS or navigation, it pushes up the diagnostic yield significantly. So we need to think again and may remember, we do not want to cause any harm either to the patient or now we have to think to your staff members, the team. There are a number of guidelines which came out with regard to bronchoscopy and Ahmed very kindly referred to this one from Mohammed Wahidi's uh, group. But again, planning forward after the pandemic is over, are we going to be able to postpone elective procedures, which all of these, the Chinese, the Americans, the Germans, the Spaniards, the Argentinians, they've all suggested postpone elective. How long can we postpone the elective? That's the, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, screening patients with temperature uh, setting, use of negative pressure room, limiting personnel during bronchoscopy, use of PPE, trying flexible rather than rigid. Some of these have been referred to already in Ahmed's uh, very nice presentation. In the British Thoracic Society, we put together guidance very early on in April as to what do we do when patients are referred for bronchoscopy. Of course, with non-malignant indications, which we used to send the referral back to the pulmonologist or for referring physician saying, is it necessary now? Can you review the patient? Is there an alternative? For malignant indications, we classified the risk low risk or confirmed or suspected COVID patients. If they are confirmed or suspected, postpone for 28 days and reassess. If they are low risk, we perform a nasal uh, a COVID swab 48 hours in advance. And then on the day or 24 hours in advance, we carry out a questionnaire, a completion of a questionnaire to see whether there are any symptoms whatsoever and then proceed from there. So this is the pattern we've been following since early April or late March. There are a number of other things to consider. What do we do about the room? It's an opportunity to go back and look at your bronchoscopy suite. Is it patient friendly? Is it COVID friendly? Is it safe for the patient and the staff? Do we have all the facilities we need? For instance, uh, a negative pressure facility or something similar with a high number of air changes. Is there a separate entry area where you can don, have all the PPE done? And then is there a separate doffing area, exit, one-way system within the endoscopy unit? These are things that we introduced uh, in, as soon as COVID started. But this will become necessary going forward, even post-COVID. Our dress code has changed quite considerably. This is our team last year. And this is now. Two things to note. The code, the dress, the, uh, the attire has changed. But also the number of people in there has also changed. We have, they have shrunk. So these are things we need to think about going forward after uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic hopefully clears. So with regard to equipment inside the suite, general anesthesia, as I'm at present, we have been performing most of our procedures with general anesthesia with ET tube so that there is a closed circuit. And then at the time of introduction of the bronchoscope, you pause ventilation for a few seconds while you introduce the bronchoscope. Always 8.5 or larger because you also do EBUS through the EBUS scope. And if you do EBUS, remember, don't use the balloon. 
it can get stuck. I've got, had frantic calls from colleagues who have rung up and said, we've lost the balloon in the tracheobronchial tree. Station two and four assessment for staging purposes can prove to be a little bit of a challenge. So you have to come up to the uh, top, uh, the subglottic area with the ET tube while you assess these, uh, these areas. Argon plasma coagulation, of course, you reduce the FiO2 at the time of the argon plasma coagulation. In the critical care unit, you would use, again, a closed circuit, a single-use bronchoscope, uh, ET tube, and in some situations, the anesthetists also prefer, uh, understandably, either in theater or in the critical care unit, to use a sheath and a little opening for the TPs within the sheath. So a number of modifications are taking place around the world with regard to bronchoscopy. With flexible bronchoscopy, a whole lot of new gadgets and new boxes have been uh, produced. This is from a uh, friend, Samir Arbat from uh, Nagpur, demonstrating his called the Arbat box, where there's an opening on top for the bronchoscope to be introduced. There's an opening on the side for the operator's hand. There's an opening on uh, either side to then assist with suctioning, et cetera. Similarly, and sim uh, a simple uh, technique that has been used is to put a little slit in the surgical mask and introduce the bronchoscope through that or use a surgical face mask and then introduce through the transnasal region, although EBUS will be difficult to perform in this fashion. So a number of innovations are taking place. One thing to note and to be mindful of is COVID and bronchoscopy has had a massive impact on our trainees, on our fellows. They've lost out quite massively in the last uh, four to five months with regard to procedures. One, because the number of procedures has dropped because of the air changes and the time taken and the referrals and the selection process, which I described earlier. There's a need to limit the number of personnel so they can't even come into the bronchoscopy suite to watch. They do not produce, uh, perform the routine bronchoscopy intubation because the anesthetist has already intubated them, these patients. And of course, they have been very busy with COVID patient work around the clock and very little time to come for training procedures. So we're looking at what we can do. And there are a number of uh, discussions that I have had, a number of people have had about the use of various other gadgets, the technology, such as a 360 degree camera, maybe um, the use of a HoloLens, the use of augmented reality, not the same as actually laying your hands on the patient and doing the procedure. Nevertheless, these are the tools and simulation that, can, that will need to be planned so that our trainees do not uh, lose out and they are adequately trained as future safe interventional pulmonologists. So coming towards the end now, interventional pulmonology is, as you know, an exciting, evolving, exponentially expanding field with a number of techniques over the years. Advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy from autofluorescence to EBUS to radial probe to navigation to transbronchial parenchymal nodal axis to robotic, Therapeutic bronchoscopy, a host of, of techniques for malignancy, including cryo and APC and stent, radiofrequency ablation, microwave, vapor, therapeutic bronchoscopy in benign conditions, which has expanded over the last 10 to 12 years, thermoplasty to valves, to vapor, et cetera, and not to forget plural interventions because they come under interventional pulmonology. How long can all these be, post be postponed? That is not possible. We need to do something differently. And with this in mind, we have tried to put together a pathway going forward because we don't know, as Ahmed has said, we don't know how long the pandemic is going to last. We cannot deny uh, other patients' procedures going forward. So trying to put some kind of a, an algorithm where from the referral time, as soon as the patient is referred, the patient is asked to isolate. Isolate from the time of referral and then they undergo, but during the period of isolation, they can undergo diagnostic procedures such as CT, PET CT, uh, full lung function tests, six minute walk tests, whatever is required for benign or surgical uh, conditions. COVID swab is performed 24 to 48 hours in advance. We're getting uh, results quicker so we can do it 24 hours in advance. There may be a role for IgG antibody in some of them um, to see whether they have developed antibody, maybe they're, they're uh, safer candidates. Um, Complete a questionnaire 24 hours in advance and on the day, we may be moving towards point of care test, a lateral flow assay. And this is something we are trialing at the moment. Uh, so at the time of the procedure, maybe antigen or antibody test, lateral flow. 
and then proceed to bronchoscopy, essential investigations for diagnosis and staging of cancer. Besides that, as far as the area is concerned, once you do all of this, that area becomes green or even super green. And the recovery is also safe because remember, there are other patients coming in there for other types of procedures, not just your bronchoscopy in case you're sharing the area with other specialties. Full PPE, nevertheless, despite all this, going forward, we will have to use full PPE. There may be a role for negative pressure ventilation. We will have to, for the foreseeable future, we need to play it absolutely safe. So in conclusion, gone with the wind, not quite. Permanent changes, partly. I think this is an opportunity. We've not had a time, an opportunity to stop and think, reflect as to what we're doing with these procedures. I think it's long overdue to review our practices, every aspect of our practices, whether it's the site, the technique, the patient selection, we do need to select carefully because we need to ask ourselves, is this procedure essential? Are there alternative options? Because at the end of the day for the patient with a single procedure, you need to achieve precise diagnosis and systematic staging if you're doing a diagnostic procedure. If it's a therapeutic procedure, it needs to be planned and executed carefully. An SOP needs to be written, and this may, be, this may differ from per, per place to place. Emergency procedures will go straight to procedure with all precautions. Urgent procedures, maybe we swab and scope, as I've shown you in the algorithm. Elective procedures, you'll, we talked about self-isolation for 14 days, swab and scope. Suits, without a doubt, we need to be protected. Gone are the days when you can just walk into the bronchoscopy suite and pick up the scope without gloves or without any protection. Not on. Suites, adapt the suite, your bronchoscopy suite, according to whatever is required, whatever it's air changes, whatever. It's a good opportunity again. Training, not to be forgotten. Simulation, role of training, role of safe training for our fellows. We need to continue with our studies. Many of our research studies, whether it's emphysema or plural diseases, have been suspended during the pandemic. That can't go on. We need to resume these studies. We need research and innovation to make progress. Safety for all, we have not thought about it previously. We absolutely have to remember that it is not just the patient, but the team that has been affected by bronchoscopy. So we need to keep absolutely everybody safe. As Scarlett O'Hara would have said, after all, tomorrow, is another day. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Munavar, for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers for staying on time. And we have, uh, I think we have at least 20 minutes or so to carry on with the discussions. Um, I would, uh, so the speakers can also ask questions and interact with, uh, with each other. Um, I would want to open up the discussion by asking Munavar, um, you know, it's, it's important now to, to have all this PPE, but, um, what do you think we should do as a, as a, as a group of physicians, if you don't have the right PPE? And you still have to do the uh, the procedures. How can we, um, perhaps as an organization, and I'm 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 asking you to answer with your hat for the British Thoracic Society and the European Society. You know what can the societies do to convince politicians and public health uh, uh, people that this is the kind of protection the uh, the bronchoscopist needs to have and not uh, a surgical mask and, uh, um, uh, and a gown. Uh, what, what, uh, what is your view on that, uh, Munavar? Oh, absolutely fabulous question, Tudor. So, finger on the pulse as always. Uh, I think this is what happened because in uh, March, uh, I was off for a few days and I got a call from my theater because I had insisted on full PPE for my colleague who was going to bronchoscope and received a call saying that the uh, nursing theater staff were objecting to the use of full PPE. It took me uh, quite some time to explain that bronchoscopy is one of the highest risk AGPs. 
that in fact a couple of ENT surgeons had died, as you know, early on, performing laryngoscopy, very, very, very sadly. And uh, we simply cannot take a risk, any, take any chance. So at every level, whether it's an institution level, at uh, a society, specialist society level, we need to raise this concern. We ha now have evidence that it causes problems not using PPE. We did not in the past. We were fighting a battle initially. You know that we wrote the BTS guidelines for bronchoscopy early on. The Public Health England, for instance, just to give you an example from the England point of view, initially questioned about the types of PPE. We went through the British Thoracic Society, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, public health organizations, and emphasized the importance of perfect PPE. Remember that it's not just you as an operator, it's the whole team is going to be affected. And we simply cannot take a chance, but as I emphasize, we should now amalgamate all the data that we have with healthcare related infections and the serious consequences that have occurred so we can put our foot down. I hope we don't need to. In fact, it's a no brainer. It's obvious that if you don't use careful protection, you're putting your staff at serious risk. I, I agree, uh, Munavar. The problem is if you don't have the PPE in stock, you know, you come up with a guideline saying, okay, so this is what you can use. But uh, again, uh, I think uh, hopefully from now on, the, uh, the politicians will be able to, uh, to, to get the stocks right. And we will never be in the situation where we don't have the stock for the right, uh, for the right procedure. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move to Italy. So I'll ask uh, Lina more or less the same question. So did you have problems to convince your administrators or the politicians that this is the level of protection you need to, uh, you need to use for bronchoscopy or how, how it was the situation in Italy? Lina, just put on the microphone. Um, sorry. Uh, in Italy, uh, the situation was quite good because uh, just at the early of the pandemic, all hospital protected uh, personnel. So in uh, the unit, in the COVID unit, uh, and uh, we uh, organized uh, COVID department uh, using a uh, uh, different setting, uh, we created uh, um, negative pressure. Uh, all nurses or medical doctor had uh, protective dispositives. And immediately we uh, used the same uh, precaution in uh, uh, endoscopy suite. Uh, we use uh, all hospital use the protection system, but unfortunately, we had some death in about, uh, we lost colleagues, uh, and, but not during the work in hospital, but probably before, before. But uh, sincerely in Italy, there was a great attention regarding personnel. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Uh, and because uh, you have the microphone on, uh, I would want to ask one more question from the list, which uh, refers to your presentation. So somebody, uh, Adrian Kutu from Paris, uh, is asking about the ECMO patients. Uh, he said that uh, in, uh, in their center, they had two cases with hemorrhage. And uh, if you have um, any evaluation what percentage of ECMO patients are having uh, bronchial bleeding as a, as a problem? What, what is your experience with that? Uh, I had experience with the severe hemorrhagia in COVID and non-COVID patient treated with uh, uh, ECMO. Uh, we treat for a, a COVID patient 11 patients and one of them, uh, the case that I show you, had uh, uh, fatal uh, hemorrhage. In the past, uh, in uh, other cases, uh, the incidence uh, in, in a non-COVID patient is uh, maybe 
one two percent. Probably uh, the incidence is more in cavitation uh, uh, due to heparin treatment uh, and. Uh, low count of blood that, that most of the patient with severe and most severe disease act because uh, all the patient treated uh, with mechanical ventilation with severe pneumonia had low uh, count of blood at the low level of blood at, uh, and uh, they was under heparin. So probably this is one of the reason of uh, uh, major incidence uh, of uh, hemorrhage in ECMO. Um, for uh, 11 patients, one hemorrhage in my hospital for COVID patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Spasari. I'll, I'll pass the microphone to you now for more uh, discussions, if you don't mind. Yes, and to, to all uh, uh, our lecturers, uh, we know we all know, and that is the question to the raised uh, that countries are different in many aspects. But we all have to fight COVID, and we all have to do bronchoscopy, both uh, safe, both for us and for our patients. So uh, my question is for all lecturers: Which measures represent the minimum requirement for the time? Something uh, that uh, you do, you do, wouldn't do bronchoscopy. Wait, please, uh, Dr. Munavar, would you be so kind to ask, to, to answer the first question? Yes, Vasave, thank you very much. I, uh, my apologies, I didn't, uh, uh, please, can you repeat that question? There was a little- Yes, which measures, uh, represent, uh, which measures represent the minimum requirement for the time uh, as for personal protection uh, uh, during bronchoscopy, both for healthcare workers and uh, for uh, us who are doing bronchoscopy? What, is, what are the minimum requirements for personal protective measures? Okay. With bronchoscopy, what is the minimum equipment that you should use? Yeah. For bronchoscopy as such, uh, because it's one of the, it is the, amongst the highest AGP risks, and you're in absolutely direct contract with the larynx and the airway, um, it is absolutely essential uh, to have the best possible PPE. Uh, so that's about the actual PPE in, with regard to the suits, uh, the suite, uh, suits that you wear, and uh, you need to have your uh, your suit, your gloves, um, your uh, mask, which should be N95 or proper respirator. You need to, which is fit tested. You need to have your goggles, the face shield, the hat. All of those, uh, literally. Um, there it should be no compromise when it comes to bronchoscopy with regard to protection. It is too dangerous to do anything uh, less than that. Besides that, you have to decide about your room and about what sort of technique you're going to use. One of the questions that uh, they've asked, related question, um, is uh, how do you perform EBAS uh, because you're doing transorally? How do you minimize the risk? And as I showed uh, earlier, we tend to perform, as it stands, we tend to perform it through the ET tube. Uh, but um, if you do all the checks in advance, uh, it should be possible, and including the 48 hour swab, the isolation, and the questionnaire, it should be possible to do it through the oral route, um, either through the, you know, as shown, the slotted uh, surgical mask or through the uh, a, a box, like the one, an example that I showed you, there are a number of other boxes which are available. Transnasal route is a bit more difficult with EBAS. Um, the second generation, smaller EBAS scopes, maybe it's possible, uh, but it still carries a little bit of a, 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 a challenge. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, 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 Dr. Ahmed, what do you think? What is the minimum requirement for, uh, uh, for the time for uh, personal protective measures, what is the Egyptian view on, 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 on uh, uh, protective equipment? How, is, how things are going in Egypt? Well, we had um, at the beginning, well, we were a bit lucky that the, the pandemic started a bit late in Egypt. So we had seen what happened in Europe and uh, in China and we were uh, kind of started working on um, 
providing the, the, the necessary PPEs for uh, doctors. We had a lot of campaigns from businessmen and uh, 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 there was one businesswoman who had, who had uh, a production line for, um, uh, for face shields and she distributed to all the hospitals all over Egypt. She uh, dispensed like 250,000 uh, uh, face shields to the to all the hospitals over Egypt. Uh, but by by March, late March, when when we started receiving cases, we had already uh, uh, several campaigns for people who had donated uh, money, and uh, all the hospitals were uh, almost stuck with the PPEs. Um, um, I think the, the least is a, a, a coverall that either is uh, reusable or sometimes now we have them as um, <clears throat> disposable or reusable that they can withstand um, uh, disinfection with the bleed with the chlor chlor chlorine uh, and uh, they, can, uh, they can be disinfected. So uh, I think coveralls covered by uh, uh, disposable gowns, uh, disposable uh, overhead and uh, face shields, uh, in addition to uh, uh, double gloving, is the minimum required to perform a bronchoscopy. Thank you, Lina. On that matter, what do you think? What is the minimum requirement? Absolutely. Uh, mm, uh, I thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity of the comment. Uh, all uh, during the pandemic, we always perform bronchoscopy uh, in endoscopy suite for cancer and for any other indication. But two elements are very important. First one, uh, three elements. First one, uh, uh, negative pressure in the room, second dispositive uh, mask, FPP2, FPP3, uh, gloves, all equipment must be present, is mandatory, and schedulate the procedure uh, uh, in order to clean uh, uh, all uh, the surface uh, or the source uh, or the instrument. You can uh, start, uh, now we have to start with all the procedure, also uh, with the elective procedure, but we have to use for everybody uh, the protection, is mandatory. Negative pressure, Schedulation of procedure and dispositive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. I so, yeah, I think uh, we're closing uh, to the um, uh, the time where we're we're about to uh, consume all the time that we have allocated for the webinar. There are a few more other questions, a couple of questions about uh, swabbing the patients before they have the bronchoscopy, but uh, we, can, we can put some of the answers on the website. Uh, I, I, I think it will not be a problem to, um, uh, to answer a few other questions on the website. Uh, I would like to go around to everybody and ask you to come up with a short conclusion, you know, your uh, reflection on this. It is the first time we're doing this webinar for the um, uh, organization. You know, it was coordinated by uh, Michael in Japan. I don't think everybody can see Michael, but he was the, uh, Hello. yes, that is Michael. Thank you very much for your um, um, coordination from Japan. And uh, uh, having said that, I would, I would invite everyone to say a couple of words as a conclusion. So Lina. I just want to thank you for uh, inviting me. I think it was a really excellent uh, webinar, uh, very, very practical uh, and very, very important key messages uh, 
for all of us. Thank you, Lina. Ahmed, what, what do you have to say from Egypt? Oh, I have to thank you, uh, Toma and uh, Pasoy and then Michael, of course, for uh, arranging this uh, webinar. I hope there will be more uh, to come. Uh, the interventional endoscopy. We need to uh, keep uh, keep things going and uh, uh, keep the continuous medical education in the times that we stop the physical meetings, as we were discussing before the starting the webinar. Thank you, and um, uh, Munavar. Oh, uh, thank you, Judah, Michael, uh, Spasue, beautifully organized uh, and uh, chaired and coordinated. And I'd also like to thank all those people who attended uh, this webinar from around the world. And just say one thing is that uh, I don't think you need to worry about performing bronchoscopies going forward, but you need to take every possible precautions. The patients need the bronchoscopies and we need to continue perform, performing them, but safely. We cannot afford to be complacent. It may be dropping in numbers in some places, but it can come back with a vengeance, uh, COVID. And uh, we just got to keep uh, at it, remain vigilant, do everything possible, take every possible precaution. And I hope all of you stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much again. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today. So um, yes. from, uh, from me from London and from Spasoy from uh, Belgrade, uh, we say thank you to all the participants, to all the panelists. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully, as the Queen said, we will meet again. Yes. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you again. Thank you again.